I have to look in the UT column, almost 1430 UT. Ilsa, are you, are you ready for the talk? Yeah, I'm good to go. Okay, so then the next talk is going to be given by Ilsa van Bemmel from Jive, our organizer. She's going to talk about the Jupyter notebooks and the EVM pipeline. Ilsa, we'll give you five minutes uh, yeah. warning. Yeah. So uh, just, just to inform you, Kazi, at the end of my uh, presentation, uh, I'll hand over to Olga for a, a quiz. So we're using the, the Slido quiz uh, setup that we used at the start. Olga showed at the start as well. And given the timing, I should be about 30, 35 minutes in the presentation and have 10 minutes left for that. Okay, and we do the questions after the quiz. Then we can Excellent. do the questions after the quiz, yes. So, well, thanks everybody for uh, still being around. We're about halfway through the lectures at this time. I'm number seven and we have 13 lectures, but we've got a few events coming up still tomorrow. So today and yesterday, we've been talking a lot about the why and what you can do in CASA. And then uh, several people have demonstrated the tasks that you can use. Uh, but I frequently find myself uh, stuck in really apparently very simple things. So part of this lecture will also address where do you find the data? How do you actually get them? And what do you check in the data processing steps and the output that CASA gives you? And I will demonstrate all this uh, using the Jupyter notebooks that we've been developing and the EVN pipeline that we are starting to implement in this environment. So first, uh, a little step back. Uh, we are at Jive here, Joint Institute for VLBI ERIC. You can forget what the ERIC stands for. And our core business is operations of the European VLBI network. And that is a very wide concept. So we do uh, support everything from the step that you come up with an idea. So you uh, propose an observing run, an, uh, a target or a schedule. We help you with the scheduling, the planning, uh, everything up until the end where we actually check your data, make sure that things are doing, that things look the way you would expect them to. And then we hand you the data as a BI and it's up to you to distract your science from it. This whole chain uh, is supported in part by uh, the EVN pipeline that's de developed many years ago in Apes Parcel Tongue. Um, but as you know, and as you see this workshop, we are moving into the CASA operations time. And one of the plans that we needed to assess is how are we going to make a pipeline in CASA? This is also very helpful for new people. If you've not uh, done any radio astronomy before, at this stage, you would go to a, one of the bigger radio astronomy schools like the NRO Summer School or the ARIS School, which we had last year in, uh, uh, in Gothenburg. Then you would learn a lot about CASA, but APES is really no longer discussed in too much detail. So for the VLBI, we really need to make that step so we can attract new people, have young users use the instruments and optimize the functionality for us. Okay, that's the wrong one. So what does the EVN pipeline do exactly? So this is only a snip out of all the steps that Jive does with your data. Actually, this starts at the point where the data comes out of the correlator and has been first quality checked by the user support staff to make sure that there is no clear technical issues that come from back-end problems at the telescope or a cable missing, whatnot. We start at the conversion of the data format into a format that we can actually read into the software. So for APES, this would be a UV FITS format or APES visibility format where you use the FITS IDI files from the correlator from the, the archive to import. And in CASA, you convert into the measurement set. And then basically the same steps are followed. You do the flagging, you do your gain calibration and fringe fitting and your band bus calibration. And at that point, your data is ready for imaging. At this stage, we're not going to discuss the imaging step in too much detail. There's lectures for this specifically tomorrow. And also in the implementation of the CASA pipeline at this stage, we're really not at the point where we have implemented the imaging yet, mainly because it requires quite a lot of interactive processing, which is not ideal in a pipeline step, but also because this was already tricky enough for us to handle. But we're getting there. We basically have a beta version of this pipeline in CASA running now, and we have constructed this in the Jupyter Notebook environment. The reason that we picked the Jupyter Notebooks 
at this point to implement the pipeline is that they are very helpful in explaining what you're actually doing. So if you look at the parcel tongue pipeline that we are running, it's consisting of a lot of scripts. It's not always clear which steps are done. Once you get to know it and to, to know what it does, it allows you some flexibility in skipping steps or doing steps twice, but it's all scripted and it does have a fairly steep learning curve. In the Jupyter notebooks, everything is still linear, but I'll show you later on how you can repeat steps quite easily. And with the explanatory text, it's always fairly clear what you're doing. And if you do prefer scripts, you can easily convert a Jupyter notebook to a basic Python script. We're now developing the EVN pipeline on the version control. That also means that if something goes wrong or people have suggestions, we're really starting to make this a serious development effort. We can implement new requests, feature requests, fix bugs, everything as a proper software development project. The really nice thing that I really prefer about the notebook environment is that it allows you to do both the data processing and the quality control in one step. Well, not exactly one step, but in one basic uh, script. So as you will see, you can do your uh, plotmas tasks after an apply call and immediately see if the data looks what you think it should look like. But just by itself, the Jupyter environment is not sufficient because we need a Jupyter environment that also has CASA included. And this has this work that's been done by Art Geimpema at Jive over the last couple of years. He has been developing the Jupyter CASA environment. And this is now all hosted in a container. You can either use a Docker or a Singularity container. Uh, since I'm a Mac user, I use Docker. Singularity for Mac is, I think, still in the beta release. And the really nice thing, and I know that several of you will already appreciate this at this stage, is you get everything in one. So all your CASA and your associated Python versions are matched. You've got your VLBI scripts in there, the Python libraries. And if there's additional functionality that we need, this can be implemented in the container. The really nice thing about this is once you've done this properly, you've you set up your notebook and it works, you don't need to make your site the typo ever again. It's something that I run in frequently when I do command line CASA processing. You type something, you mistype the name of a command or mistype the name of a file. Of course, in scripts, you've got the same benefit. But the main thing here is also that you do not need to bother with any path settings. And I've seen already quite a few questions about this, that your libraries are not there or your path settings are not correct. This is all taken care of inside the notebook and you don't need to worry about this. So to give you an idea of what we're implementing, this is the scary bit of my presentation, actually. I'm now going to show you first a flowchart of all the steps that we got in a notebook. And I will give you a semi-live demonstration of how you get all the stuff in there yourself. So I'll stop sharing my presentation and start sharing the browser, which I was looking for. Share. So first, yeah, this is all set. So this is a standardized flowchart that we've been working with to implement all the steps in the pipeline. And you can see here on the left side, it says calibration and the lower bar says quality control. And if I would scroll down a little bit, there is the imaging steps as well, which have not yet been implemented. This is the reason why they're separated. So we start here with this little circle, which is where the correlator is done and the data are archived in the EVN archive. And we start with the import step. We run our metadata scripts, the VLBI scripts that Mark has developed. And at this point, you could do already an initial inspection of your gain curve and system temperatures. Typically, then you would import this. So if you would do this from the command line, this arrow here is the point where you launch your CASA. In the notebook, you don't notice that difference. So you've got imported data into a measurement set in CASA, you inspect the contents of that measurement set, and you go on to generate the CASA calibration tables for gain and system temperature. So we'll move a little bit to the side. You can at this stage also plot uh, your gain curve uh, calibration tables or your system temperature calibration tables. You can even edit them or smooth them. These steps are currently not in a notebook, so there's no uh, associated quality control here. 
but that can of course be, be added. The next two blocks are flagging and they are separated in manual and automated flagging, mainly because uh, the way that we currently do this is still mostly manual. So you have your flags that have been added to the EVN archival data, which you need to apply. I, I refer to this as manual flagging because these flags have been collected by the telescope operators and the user support staff into a file, a human readable file that you can apply to your data. <clears throat> we are experimenting at the moment with the automated flagging. For example, the AO flagger has been mentioned several times. At this point, the experiences are somewhat mixed and we need to get in touch with the developers there to see how we can optimize this for VLBI data processing. The really nice thing of having automated flagging is that you take away all human bias that you might have if you see something and think it's nice, you, you want to keep it even if it's noise. If you want, you can even introduce data signals in your data that are not real. So removing that bias is something that's interesting and also with increasing data sizes, it gets more and more tedious to do this by hand. You'd really want to automate that. So what I do at the moment myself, I do the manual flagging, but I do keep a log of the flags that I have applied and I eventually make that into a flag file that I can apply. So every time I repeat a particular data processing uh, for a, an experiment, I reapply that particular flag file so that's perfectly repeatable and I don't need to do things again. So this is a bit tedious if you do flagging in Plotomess, but I, what, what I usually do is note down the flags that I see in Plotomess and transfer them to that file. So bookkeeping here is definitely important and somewhat problematic. So even. After you're happy with all the flags, you start with your, uh, what I refer to as the hardcore calibration steps for the visibilities and the instrumental delay correction. And you may have heard several terms for this flying around. It's called manual phase scale. Uh, it, it's called single band delay correction. It's called instrumental delay correction. And I refer to it as instrumental delay correction because that's mainly what you're correcting for, for, for errors in the instrument that arise from all sorts of effects, but which do not vary or not vary too much over the time of an observation. You do your multiband delay fringe fitting. So this is where you start fitting the delays and rate as a function of time using your phase calibrator. And when you're done, you apply a bandpass calibration. And all these have several quality control steps associated with them. You can either plot the solutions directly for the bandpass or the uh, fringe fitting uh, calibration tables or you can apply them to your data and inspect the calibrated data. This is more tedious because the apply cal step is not the fastest one and for large data sets, this can take some time. But once you're happy with all your calibration tables, you apply all of them to your data, you split out your targets and calibrators, and then you're basically done with your visibility calibration and you start your imaging. So what would you actually start doing if you are a user and you would want to have a look at an archival data set of the EVM. First thing you do is that you go to the homepage. And on the Jive homepage, there is this block that says EVM data archive, and it gives you several options to address the archive, to find it. So the archive home looks like this. You need to know your experiment number and then you can type it here or select it from the drop down menu and look what's in there. If you know, for example, the PI, but not the experiment number, you can use the browse catalog option. So you can select here whichever variable you want to, which observation period, and then submit the query and we'll find it for you. Most astronomers, when they are looking for data in the archive, however, will know that they're looking for a certain source. And that's where you have the search archive function. So these options are all under this uh, Jive EVN archive button on the Jive main page. So here is the tool where you can actually add a source, select which kind of data you're looking for and see if it's present in the archive. This is very helpful also if you're preparing a, an observing proposal to check if this source has already been observed before. Now let's check this particular session as I know this interface best 
and let's select a data set. So in this case, I will select N14C3. What a surprise. So you get already on this little side window a few, an overview of what's in the data set. But of course, you would want to go and download some data. So you show experiments, you get some blurbs about the data, but where you want to go initially is to the FITS files. The FITS files are the main visibility data set. And in this case, you see there's two, IDI1 and IDI2. And there's this convenient line here that tells you what you could type into your uh, terminal window to download the data. So you can copy and paste that and then just sit around and wait until everything is in your machine. Besides the FITS fit files, you also need the metadata. And you can find this under the pipeline button. The pipeline has a bunch of products that it produces. And you can see here the list of all the stuff that comes out of the pipeline, the APES pipeline. If you're a PI of an experiment, this is where you should go and start checking what has actually been done to your data. Make sure that you understand what you're looking at. For this particular case, we're looking only for the metadata, which is under the associated EVN calibration. And I hover over this, it's probably not readable for you on the screen, but now it pops a little window under my mouse that says that there is an untap file associated with this. So I want to download this particular file, the n14c3.untap. And I also want the flags that have been applied in this pipeline. These are the flags from the logs and the stations, and they come in a file called n14c3.uv flag without an A. So these are the two metadata files that we start our tutorials with, which you can download from the EVN archive. And every data set that you find has these associated with them. And in some cases, if you've got spectral line data, you will see a little note right here that tells you that there are several correlator passes, pass one and pass two. And pass one is usually your continuum data processing and pass two is the line data. So in that case, also for the FITS files, you will get a bunch of FITS files where the IDI numbers are consecutive, but this one here, just before the dot, then has one or two, which is associated with the correlator pass. So that's where you find your data. Now, if you wanted to process this in a notebook, you can download any of the temp uh, template notebooks and hopefully successfully install the Jupyter environment and launch it. If you can't, then on the slides that I shared, there is a link to the Jupyter Notebook Viewer. The Notebook Viewer itself looks fairly basic. It looks like this, and it gives you a little window where you can copy and paste the link to any notebook, type go, and it shows you what is inside that notebook. So this is the tutorial for the N14C3 run, and I'm going to show you my own personal notebook, which has been running live just recently been changed. So I'll go through the notebook and show you some interesting features that you could keep in mind. Uh, this is not just particular to the notebook. This is also possible if you're running this CASA from the command line and you will see the same outputs. But already here you see that the nice thing about the notebook is that you have a little bit of text on top explaining what it is. Add some links, you can add some figures and then people can immediately find some references for the data. So if I was a user support scientist and I found something really peculiar going on in this particular experiment, I would probably make a note here saying, look, um, in scan such and such, there's something weird going on. Please check if the data is still useful or otherwise flag that scan. So the first cell that you get around, this is a code cell that actually give you a lot of basic information about what is uh, the useful scans for this particular observation to do your calibration with. If you are having a new experiment, you won't know exactly what to put here. You will not know for sure which scan contains your fringe finder source. You don't know which field contains your face calibrator. So you can leave it empty, um, perform the first few steps, and then from the list ops file that you generate, you can fill in these values. Interesting thing to note here, it says for the reference antenna, I've only selected Applesburg. And in this case, we know this is su sufficient. But if you would want to change this to a list for the fringe fitting uh, to take another antenna when there is 
no apples back, you could add, for example, Westerbork here, or Jodrell Bank, or Onsela. And this list will be taken by fringe fitting. And when the first antenna is not present, it will jump automatically to the second, then to the third, until it runs out of that list and nothing is available. And then it will crash and tell you, I didn't have a reference antenna. So below this line here, a lot of things are set for the notebook to run. And then the pre-calibration steps start. These are the steps that include all the VLBI scripts from, uh, the, from Mark. So the appendix sys is done here, conversion of the flag table and the gain curve. And then where it says number five here is where you do the import fits IDI. Number six is noting uh, is notable. That's where we apply the first flag, the UV flags. Uh, at this point, I also do a flag manager run to rename the flag versions to a sensible name so that when I start from scratch, I can just clear out all my calibrations, restore the flags to only the flags that are from the archive and start from there again. So this is the output from the list ops. The list ops, I'm not sure if this has been discussed in the first lecture because I've been doing some organizational stuff in the background. The list ops is extremely useful to, to show you where all your sources are, which scan has which source, which time range it was observed. And you may have noticed that at the top, I selected scan 37 for one of the, the for the single band delay fringe fit, the instrumental delay. And the time range of that scan is actually four minutes, three minutes, sorry. In some cases, it helps to not have the full scan, but just uh, select the middle part of the scan. So the edges of the scan can sometimes generate a little bit more noise in your fringe fitting. So in that case, you would give it a time range instead of a scan number. And you can find all that information here. If you scroll all the way down to the bottom, it also tells you a little bit about the field codes that you have. So field zero, you should be aware CASA is always zero based, is one of your calibrators. 3C345 is field one, etc. You've got your spectral windows here, the number of channels, channel width, and the correlations that are present in these channels. So we have four correlations, all the cross correlations are there. And you can see the eight consecutive channels with their central frequencies. So this is always very helpful information to know what to expect when you start plotting this in PlotMS. You can immediately see if this is sensible. So once we've got all that checked, we know which scans we want to use for what calibration steps. You usually start with generating the system temperature and gain curve uh, calibration tables we've done in these steps. And you can check, for example, here for the system temperature, what the log says. This is the output that you normally get in your CASA logger. So it's not just a notebook thing, this is a CASA thing. And you have loads of warnings here this is all points where the system temperature does not exist. So there's data points there, visibility data points there, but or it expects visibility data points and it's expecting a system temperature, but that's not there. So what will happen in the apply cal step is that if there is any data, uh, for example, here for antenna three and spectral window one, it will be flagged. Usually this is rather benign, so you don't have to worry about it too much. You can, of course, always do a plot cal or a plot MS plot of your system temperature to see if there's really big issues there. So in this case, what I did, just do an apply cal of the system temperature and the gain curve and see what that does. Well, to your faces, it doesn't do too much. You still see quite a lot of noise. But for the amplitudes versus frequency, this is the uncalibrated amplitudes. You see similar fluxes, gains at this site, but fairly small numbers as a function of frequency. So here's your eight spectral windows. This corresponds nicely to what the list of Sven said. And now after the gain curve calibration, you see that the fluxes or the gains are starting to see around one, except for this orange one here, which is definitely a lot higher. So it's immediately something that you would want to check in, in Potomac, which telescope are the orange points. This is one of the disadvantages actually of the notebook environment. It's you don't have to locate button here. So what I usually do is have a CASA running on the site where I can immediately check for this particular measurement set. If I make that plot, which are the orange points and do I want to flag those or not? So that's where we get to the flagging steps. 
for some of these data, I already know that, that this is bad. So for Svetlo, for example, I know it's bad. For hard to paste hook, scan 62 was bad. And here you can also keep a record of all the flags that you apply to your data as you are adding them either in your plot MS or other structures. Or you can make a file, or you can keep them here, that's up to you. A thing to note for VLBI specific data processing, we always flag some of the edge channels. So we have 32 channels in this data set. Typically you would flag 10% on either side. This is the bandpass drops off so steeply that you will not get any sensible solutions for your uh, fringe fitting calibration there. In this case, I also flagged the first five seconds of every scan. And usually the autocorrelations are flagged during the, uh, the correlation, but it's not always the case. Sometimes they are kept. And in that case, you could do an AC core if you need it. But at this particular step, we don't go into that detail. So again, here is a flag manager step to save a flag file or a, uh, a version of my flags. Depending on your taste, you can make this a file or a flag version inside the Casa flags. And then if anything goes wrong with the calibration that follows this step, I restore this flag version and start from this point. So these are corresponding essentially to all the blocks that I showed you in the flow chart. We get to the fringe fitting now. And here, what's interesting to note uh, is the output from the, the fringe fitter in the CASA log actually does have some useful information. So if I would scroll down, you start to see all these signal to noise values. So this is spectral window zero. All your antennas are here for both correlations, the RR and the LL, never know which order they are. And you see that we've set a threshold of 50, but in this case, antenna nine has a lower value than 50, which means the solutions will be flagged for this one. What is good to know is that for most of the antennas, all the values are high, which is what you would expect for a fringe finding source. And the least squares converges in only a handful of iterations. If this should be a very high number or an exact round number, you should start to get worried. It usually means it hasn't converged and your solutions are not sensible. So you would see that these outputs occur for each spectral window. And then at the end, you see an overview of each spectral window. And there's all ones here. That means that it has successfully found solutions for each spectral window. And your day is good. So if you apply this instrumental delay correction to the scan that you used to derive it, we've been seeing this a few times already, you see that the phases are all nicely lined up. There's no phase jumps, and they're all around zero degrees. And you see the difference here. Some faces have a little wiggle in them, and some are straight. And this is the difference between telescopes with a digital backhand receiver and an analog backhand receiver. And it's something that you, in the end, can correct for with your bandpass calibration. So the CASA bandpass provides a complex bandpass. Now, this is only for the scan for which you did your instrumental delay correction. If you look at another scan, you see that the phases nicely line up but there is a slope again, especially for the longer baselines, this will be obvious. The slope is there because you're looking at a different point in the sky, different time as well. Also here, the, the wiggles and the straight lines are more obvious. So after we're happy with the single band delay, instrumental delay, we go to our multi-band delay. Well, you've seen all the settings in this, for this in, in Dessus talk, so I won't go into detail. I'll just show you here a different way to inspect your solutions. This is actually the plot cal task. So I'm plotting here the delay rate as a function of time and the delay as a function of time. Now this looks a little bit weird. It has a few points which are off. So you can either inspect which stations are responsible for this or flag the solutions in plot cal. For the delay rate, it seems to be noisy, but actually if you check the scale on the y-axis, this is picoseconds per second and it doesn't even go beyond one. So I'd be perfectly happy with this. So finally, we end up with the bandpass. And it was interesting, there was some discussion of, on this uh, this morning, whether the issues with people seeing a slightly different plot from their data processing when they compared it to the EVN Jive tutorial, that might have been related to the bandpass. And this is a nice thing where you can demonstrate the power of the Jupyter notebooks. So I did the bandpass in the way it's described, and you get the plot. And I mean, then I did the way the bandpass 
uh, is not described. And the only thing I changed here is the sole norm parameter here. So now I've set it to false. And you can see the plot here, clearly very different. There's a very different scale here on the y axis than here on the y axis. So here it's all around one. And here it ranges from 3.5 to 0 0.5. So what is the difference if you apply this to the data was is indeed the, the trick. And if you apply all your calibrations and I must admit, I don't know why I now have to scroll through the figures because previously it didn't do that. But you can see this, this plot looks remarkably similar to what people posted in the MetaMost this morning. It has the big offset for the orange uh, data here, stats here. And when I do sole norm is false, I have to scroll down a little bit further. Then we get this plot, so it's same amplitude, corrected versus frequency. And now I get the same plot that is shown in the tutorial. So the issue with that particular thing was the sole norm. And just copying and pasting these two cells in the notebook and rerunning them is sufficient to quickly check if that's indeed the case. So that's a nice thing about the notebooks that you can easily compare the settings of a task, change one item, copy or just run it again and get the output immediately on your screen and see if that's what you're looking for. And once you're happy, of course, you save your notebook and the next time you want to rerun it, you're done and you have got exactly the same settings. So for Jive, this is really interesting as one of our purposes in the longer term is that we can provide users not only with their data sets, but also with the pipeline processing that we've done. So you get a data set and on the archive, for example, where you've got your fits data and your associated calibration tables, you would also find a link to the notebook that was used to produce these results. So you can either reproduce them yourself or quickly have a look and optimize some of the settings to make sure that things look better and you have science ready data. And at some point you could even upload your notebook back to the Jive archive and say, okay, this is the notebook that I've used to publish the figure on this data set that I published in this nature paper. So that makes things very helpful for us as well to optimize our data processing structure. So let me just quickly check if I've addressed everything I wanted to address in the notebooks. Yes, I did. So we're gearing up towards the end of the presentation. I'll go back and share my Presentation again, there's a few remarks that I wanted to make here. So we've seen this and if you download the presentation, all these links are active. So there's one warning, last warning, I cannot iterate this enough. The, the flagging in the apply cal will be iterative, so uh, cumulative, sorry. So when you do the apply cal, and for example, uh, there's some poor system temperature data or no system temperature data for part of your data, that data will be flagged, the visibility data that's associated with that part of your system temperature measurements. It will be flagged. This means that at some point, for example, in your instrumental delay calibration, the data will be noisier than expected. It will drop below your signal to noise boundaries and such you get a sort of cumulative uh, increase in uh, noise or uh, degradation of your data quality because of this and apply cal will continue to flag more and more stuff. And I've seen it happen uh, that people end up with no data or seemingly no data, which means that everything has been flagged and you basically have to start from scratch. Now this is fine. I've, I've shown you at the point where I do the flag manager uh, steps to make flag versions that I can revert back to when I start the, re, uh, the calibration from that point. This is something that you should not forget to do. It's always important to restore your flagging. And even one out of five, six times that I do a rerun of the calibration, I forget to do this and end up with a mess. So restore your flags, make sure that you keep uh, a good track of what you've been doing. And at some point I have experienced this a few times is when the uh, something corrupts either in the flag table or the measurement set, you get really weird things. If you plot stuff in your plotter mass and it looks totally not what, like what you would expect it to look like, it's always a good idea to start from scratch. And you can start at the point where you're importing your FITS IDI files into 
the CASA measurement set, you've already applied the system temperature append step. So you don't need to rerun that, but then you start with a clean measurement set and a clean flag table. So this is just, this is just for future reference for you. If you wanted to look at the notebook viewer, these are the links to it. And now we'll go and jump to the quiz. We've got about 10 minutes left. So I'll stop sharing my screen and hand over the screen share to Olga. And I hope she has also reiterated the event code. I'll put it in the chat as well. So if you can all go to the slide.do website and the event code is M496, which are now listed in the chat. And I'll look up my questions here. Okay, so as people are joining, can, can we see how many people have joined yet, Olga? Or should we just go ahead and ask the questions? Okay. Oh, you can't see the figures very well. Yeah, there they go. So the first question to you. Um, these are two figures that I just showed in the notebook, figure A and figure B. And this is part of the single band delay fringe fitting. So they both have the single band delay fringe corrections applied. And show you a bright source on the, on the left side with the, the scan on the bright source for the calibrator. So what is problematic with, is there a problem with number with B? And let me properly why, oh, sorry. Why does the instrumental delay not properly correct the phases for another scan, which is shown in figure B? So where is, I don't see the options for the, the answers yet. Okay. So the option is not bright enough. It's in a different location or antennas have dropped out. We really only have eight people participating in this time. Anyway, the majority is right. Um, the, the, the figure B is a source in a different location in the sky, also it's at a slightly different time, uh, which affects your phase calibrations. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So the next uh, question is getting slightly more complicated. I see that you've all been paying attention to the fringe fitting steps. So on the left, figure A is an uncalibrated file, uh, uncalibrated data on the right side, figure B has calibration applied. The question is, what is the difference between figure A and figure B? So which calibration has been applied to get to figure B? Is this the system temperature calibration? It's a bit of a trick question here. The single band delay fringe fitting calibration? Was it the band pass calibration? Or is it the gain curve calibration? So what is the difference in calibration between A and B? Can you show the uh, the answers, Olka, the, the people replying? Okay, so this was obviously already a little bit trickier. Um, and, and as I was reading the answers back, I almost gave it away. There is a bit of a trick here. It's, it both includes the system temperature calibration and the gain curve calibration, but the main effect that you see here uh, is, is the gain curve, which normalizes your amplitudes to around one. So. Answer A is almost right, but answer D, the last one, is really the correct one. Yay, we're starting to see people. Oh gosh, Harold is leading. Now there's a trick question. Okay, so up to the next question. There's two more. This is the before last one. So here you see uh, a cutout from the list ops output. And the question is, 
all the information included is here is, is about the setup of your observation and what is the channel setup for a single spectral window in this case. So the answer options are there's 32 channels and each channel is 16,000 kilohertz wide. Or option B, there's 500 channels and each channel is 16,000 kilohertz wide. There's option C, there's 32 channels and each channel is 500 kilohertz wide. Or the last option, there's 32 channels and they have different widths. Yes, everybody has been looking very carefully, or almost everybody looking care very carefully. So the, the trick here is that the difference is between the channel width and the total bandwidth. So the total bandwidth is the sum of all your eight spectral windows, but the channel width is actually the width of each uh, channel. So each spectral window has 32 channels and each channel is 500 kilohertz wide. And each spectral window is 16,000 kilohertz wide. Okay, last question. Here is a cutout from the GenCal output log. So this is what you would see in your CASA logger when you generate the calibration table for system temperature. What does this warning mean? So the options here are antenna one has missing system temperature data, but you can ignore the warning. Option B is antenna three has missing system temperature data, but you can ignore the warning. Option C is antenna zero has missing system temperature data, but you can ignore the warning. And option D is this is a critical problem and you really need to fix your system temperature table. So what do people think? Time for the questions. Antenna three has missing system temperature data and you can ignore the warning and that is correct. Um, the number one in this out cutout actually referred to the polarization and the number zero referred to the spectral window. So that's obvious. And in all cases, these warnings are benign. You can ignore them. And if you are really getting concerned about this, just plot your system temperature table in PlotMS and you can see if there is any issues there. So this was the last question for the poll. I'm, I'm really glad to see that people have been paying quite a lot of attention, especially to the, the fringe fitting step. That is something that is really tricky to comprehend. And that is the end of my presentation. So I'm ready to take questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, oops. thank you very much, Ilse. I almost threw my tea over my laptop. I was very enthusiastic. So you're in perfect timing. So let me see. If there are some questions in the, so that there has been a question, but it was already answered by, by Mark about the CASA pipeline. Is it supposed to replace parcel tongue APES pipeline, which currently is used to produce Jive standard output for users uh, in the near future? And Mark replied for some definition of near. So he was very politically correct on which the, the, the person who asked the question, Artis, said, near, do you mean f a few years, two to three? I think that's a reasonable estimate. Um, at this point, we've been working with the pipeline quite extensively for continuum data, but we're still in the process of uh, verifying it for the maser line observations. So that is something that takes some time. And also to make sure that uh, these things are overlapping at some point, we, we may start to release CASA pipeline data to the archive, but some users may want to have the APES pipeline as well to make sure that things are identical. All these kinds of verifications are still ongoing, but it's uh, at some point um, we will have to slowly let go of APES. Okay, that's, that's a clear way forward. So there is somebody now typing, a yes, Yun finished his question. Will the Jupiter pipeline keep tracking CASA release? and make an appropriate update. So CASA, update, CASA releases every, every year or so a new, yes. 
and your release? Um, so this is a very good question. Yeah, that's a really good question. And I didn't really address that here. Um, the plan is after the workshop to start moving to CASA 6 and, and Python 3 also for the pipeline. And then we should indeed track the, the CASA releases. Uh, this is a bit tricky now at the moment for the current version of the pipeline because it's uh, it's based the Jupyter notebooks contain 5.6 and 5.7 was built by NREO on a different uh, platform so to say it's, it's it's slightly more complicated than that but the bottom line is that including CASA 5.7 in the current Jupyter notebook environment was a lot trickier uh, than expected so we'd rather make that step in one go and straight go straight to 5.6 and then follow the releases from there. So, the, but the idea is that at some point, because this is a Docker container uh, environment, the, you can basically preserve the settings for the data processing that you've done for any particular data set. So you, you get your, your notebook, you get a version of this, the Docker container that we've run this in, or maybe even an exact copy of this. Um, as you can tell, I'm not the expert on how this works in, in too much detail, but the idea is that you can reproduce the data processing that we have done in the pipeline environment on your own machine without having to install all these things. So if you have your data processed in CASA 5.5, that would be the version that's included in the notebook. If you would have the data processing in 6.2, that's the version that would be in the notebook, etc. Okay, so they, every every data reduction will be tied to a, to a CASA version. Exactly. Which only becomes a problem in 10 years from now, when we will have computers that can no longer run old CASA versions, this is, these are problems that Alma's running into <laughs> because the very early Alma data yeah. is, is yeah. working with the CASA version, which most of the computers cannot install. Well, yeah. the, the, the Alma regional centers still have them. Actually, we... the, the containers yeah. are supposed to uh, prevent this from happen, happening. As long as you can still run the container, um, it should work. Yeah, yeah but what Cassie is mentioning is currently for the older Alma data, there the CASA version still exists, but they are not containerized. So they, they just uh, standalone installs for Red Hat's very old. Yeah. And most yeah. people don't run that anymore. No, no, they can go to the Alma Regional Center, which have a computer specialist that will then be forced to find this CASA version if it's not yet present and install it and run the data. But yeah, or or it, it just needs to be passed through the new pipeline mm -hmm. if it's feasible. So let me see if there are other other questions. Let's <coughs> see. Yes, we have another one. How long does it take to reduce the data through the pipeline? Taking an, an average, I don't know, yeah. eight hour, twelve hour EVN data set. Uh, yeah, well, I, I, I actually did this just last night for the N14T3, but obviously this depends on, on the system that you're running your uh, data processing on. So on my own laptop, the, the notebook that I just showed, the N14T3, takes about an hour. If I would do this on one of the Jive development machines, it would easily speed up things by a factor of three to four. So it mainly depends on the memory, but also the, the, the possibility of, of faster CPU access. The, in the, the CASA has the option to uh, use multi-threading, the MPI package, and, and Jack told me offline that he's been able to uh, activate this and now speed up things significantly, especially the appendices, for example. It takes a couple of minutes on my laptop. Uh, he reports that it can be done in 10, 15 seconds with the MPI package. So there is a, a, more, a specification to the question. What's the volume of, of this data set in gigabytes? Uh, the, the N14C3 is two and a half to three gigabytes. So that's for EVN, it's, it's a rather small yes, data yeah. set. We are now starting to play with the spectral line data. They are orders of hundreds of gigabytes. That's because of the spectral resolution in these data sets. Uh, for continuum data sets, you usually not exceeding a couple of gigabytes per data set. 10 gigabytes is sort of standard for a, yeah. for a continuum data set. All right, we have other questions in the, in the Jupyter notebook. Um, is there any hard limit on the memory requirements specific to VLBI and EVN data of the, of the machine? Do you have a, a number? 
I am not from the top of my head, actually. And, and I must say that uh, although this, this was an issue in, in older CASA versions, I've not had that problem in recent years. Mm. Um, so I, I know that the CASA developers have been looking into making a, a task that could quickly check if your laptop is suitable to run CASA for certain data sets, but that never really materialized, mainly because users no longer ask for it. So it's hard to give numbers here. Yeah, I, I know there is somewhere on the Cas NRAO CASA website the, the specifics of, of, the of the computer on, on which to install CASA. Yeah. So if I find back the link, I will place it in the Jupyter Notebook. Yeah, I think it's on the download page, they have some guidelines. Yes. So then we have two more questions. Uh, one from Mustafa Yildiz. Some of the tasks use parallel programming, as you already mentioned, MPI CASA, but some tasks use only one core. Do you know if there is any planning to upgrade this single core task? Um, well, actually, uh, for CASA 6, not a whole lot will change, but there are already plans for beyond CASA 6, where everything will be completely parallelized. So all tasks will be parallel. Um, and, and the current issue with CASA is that some tasks have options to do parallelization, and they follow a different code path from the singular uh, performance in that same task can, and can sometimes give different results. So this is a big issue for the Alma pipeline, for example. So for the future, and then I'm talking about five to 10 years easily in the future, uh, a next generation package will be developed, which is completely parallel. Uh, and Areo now calls this next generation CASA, and they've been advertising this in uh, platforms such as the ADAS, the software, astronomy software meetings, where they uh, look for feedback from people at the development level, but I think in a couple of years, they will start to be more at, uh, vocal about this also towards the users. But it will be, t it will be a while. Okay, thank um, you, Ilsa. Then I Ilsa, have one last, oh, sorry. yes? Uh, just, just to add on, on, on that question, very briefly is that actually, even if a, car, a task is there right now, which does not run in parallel, you can always directly inter uh, interface with the MPI option in CASA and just manually run it uh, in parallel. That's, for example, what I did with the fringe fit task. It just requires some extra coding, but if you need that speed, that's uh, easily possible with every task. Okay, thanks for that uh, addition, Miguel. Yes, thank you, Michael. So I will go into the last question. If, if not, nothing else comes up. So Miguel is asking, will Jive make fast computers locally at Jive available to run remotely uh, these Jupyter notebooks, at least for the PIs of, say, the last two to three years? Uh, yes, I, um, but I have to look with a sort of slanted eye at Mark. The idea is that we are going to host a Jupyter hub. And from what I understand, this is exactly what is intended. So people, a PI can access the hub at Jive, process their data on our machines and make sure that it's optimized for the science that they want to do with this. And hopefully also provide us some feedback um, and doesn't need to do this on the local machines. That's, that's correct, right, Mark? Yeah, well, um, what's currently funded, we're doing this in, in a, a project called Express, and sorry, Escape. <laughs> starts with an E as well, which is sort of trying to bring, uh, people might, might have heard about the European Open Science Cloud. And, and this is sort of the, the astronomy uh, contribution to that platform. And as part of that, we are developing this Jupyter Notebook infrastructure. And within that project, we have money to get one server. So that might be good enough for a part of the PIs, um, but maybe not for, for all of our PIs, then we need to extend that infrastructure and then we'd need to find money for that. But yeah. Yes, it is. It is at least, uh, we're, we're planning to do at least a demonstrator of this functionality um, that will be accessible to those, the people that, that would want to use it, uh, the PIs, EVM PIs that would want to use this. Yeah. Yeah, like with all these kind of developments, you don't want 100 people to start using it in one go before you know that it actually works. And yes, okay. that has indeed the benefit that getting the data from the from the archive will be almost instant. 
because uh, the, the, the machines will be sitting very close together. Um, and uh, uh, it will be a fairly powerful machine, so you won't run out of uh, memory. But some people will still, uh, we, we anticipate that some of the PIs will still prefer to do the data reduction on their own machines. And some will still prefer to use apes 10 years from now. Yeah, everybody does what, what they like best. Exactly. So I have the feeling that we have exhausted the questions for now. Um, I, I advise people if more, more questions come up for, for Ilse, please put them in the notebook. The same also for, um, for, for Ivan of the typical data problems. And I would say let's, let's close this, this session here. Thank both our speakers, Ivan and Ilse, for two very nice talks and reconvene for data processing C at 1600 hours UT. Yes. yes. If you allow me to make one announcement is that I fixed the Japan thesis script um, for spectral line data sets. So if you checked it out using Git, you can simply run Git update to get it or other download a, a new uh, zip file with the, the scripts and run those. If you don't have spectral line data, you probably don't need to, to do anything. Excellent, that was super fast. That's really on the fly problem solving. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, I see also, also Mateusz is, uh, is very, very happy with that. So thank you, Mark. Thank the speakers and say thank to all the attendees and everybody who interacted on the various platforms. Thanks. See you at 1600.